All right, well, it is four o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started here. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody for joining us. I'm Chrissy Allen. I'm the development director here at Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And this is our first live story of place. Uh, it's a part of a series. It's gonna be an oral history project that we are doing uh, to capture some of the wonderful stories and histories about Blue Hill Heritage Trust conserved properties, as well as a few other places around the peninsula that are just really special and of great importance to our you know, culture and our heritage here. And this series is dedicated to a really dear friend of mine, Bob Slavin, who passed away uh, late last year. And if you knew Bob, you knew that he had an absolutely infectious love of this place and also the history and the story of this place. So in the time that I got to spend with Bob, I, I very much was inspired to start recording these histories. And I'm very fortunate that I was able to record the history of the granite quarries in East Blue Hill with Bob in October. And that is available on our YouTube channel um, and our website as well. So I hope that you will, you'll check out that really wonderful presentation with Bob and myself. Um, I'd like to recognize that the mountain has a really vast history, well beyond what we're going to discuss today. And it goes by other names and it has a special meaning for all of the human communities that have lived on these lands. It's home uh, to many, either physically as habitat or spiritually. And we are going to, um, we're going to talk about why conservation was so critical on this place and really focus on that part of its history, the conservation history. Um, I hope that you'll enjoy this slideshow that's going to be going on as we are, as we're talking. There are some historic tidbits on some of the slides sort of going in a chronological order, as well as just a bunch of other photos peppered in of a few ways the mountain is enjoyed by our communities or the critters that call it home or just some really beautiful shots of that place. Um, today, I'm very pleased to be joined by three people who are connected to the mountain and the conservation work that has been done there. Ellen Best has been involved with Blue Hill Heritage Trust since 1989, over 30 years, on our board of directors, as well as on various committees. Um, Ellen has been a part of the trust almost as long as we've been in existence. Jim Dow uh, served on the board from 94 to 2001 when he became the trust's first executive director and hired me and, and George Fields, who's also still here with the, with the trust. And he was here with us until his retirement in 2016. And Mary Ely is one of the trust's most active volunteers. She helps on a number of outreach projects and also helps to coordinate our important trail steward program and is the steward for the trails on the front face of the mountain, which you see in the photo there. Um, unable to join us today is Ellen Werner. And Ellen is one of the founding board members of Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And she was board president at the time that one property in particular, which we're gonna discuss, which was kind of a game changer for both the mountain, but also the organization. She was president at the time that that happened. And she has sent along some really wonderful memories of that time and sort of the story of that particular property um, that I'll be sharing here in just a minute. Um, I'll also say that I've consulted with Peter Clapp, who's no big fan of Zoom, but he is a wonderful storyteller and a wealth of knowledge. Peter's another founding board member who's still with the trust today on our board. And Peter shared some really terrific thoughts, uh, which helped me think about the questions to ask for this. So Peter's definitely here with us uh, in spirit <laughs> and not having to deal with the technology world of Zoom. Um, so I want to start by actually talking about something that Peter reflected on, and then I'm going to share some of Ellen Werner's thoughts and ask questions of our panelists who are joining us today about their own memories of the mountain and thoughts about, you know, what's going on there today. So when I was talking to Peter, he was talking about how the first purchase on the mountain really was a turning point for the trust. 
and one that their board of directors at the time had to spend a lot of time considering. And I talked to Ellen Werner about this as well, and you know, sort of asked them both as founding board members, how did the effort to purchase and conserve this part of the mountain feel really different from past efforts of conservation that had happened within the organization. And here's, a, here's I'm gonna read for a minute here what Ellen Werner wrote back. She said, so we go back to the beginning. Jean Nickerson was instrumental in the founding of Blue Hill Heritage Trust and she was the first president. And Ellen, she says, I was one of the founding members. At the early meetings, we discussed what properties, watersheds, view sheds were important to save. We discussed a lot. Of course, those discussions started with Blue Hill Mountain. I watched over, it watched over the entire peninsula and whoever thought that it needed to be saved. Louise Fredericks owned the trail piece as well as acreage across the face. The Hayes family had donated the beautiful fields, but the rest of the mountain was too steep and inconvenient to build on. We were wrong. The blueberry field on the western side of the mountain had been owned and operated by the Allen family for decades. And she also notes that even though this is not a topic about the mountain, that very early on in the trust's life, there was a lot of talk by the board and enthusiasm and good intentions about their conservation efforts, but they didn't actually have any land when they first started. And early on, there were a few key parcels of land that were donated on Toddy Pond and in Brooklyn. And she wanted to specifically mention Ken and Marnie Crowell, who donated the first parcel on Fourth Pond, which is a seed that was planted and has now become the incredible Kingdom Woods Conservation Area. And that's a, that's a property that we will definitely touch on in another one of these Story of Place series. So Ellen, I, I'm, I'm going to throw the first question out to you. Uh, in listening to Ellen Werner's um, remarks and reading some of the past literature through the trust, it was marked that it was a contested property. And this property in particular that Ellen is going to go into discussing further in her notes. Can you touch upon a little bit of what was going on in this property, which we now know as Wardwell Pasture, which is sort of right at the corner of Route 15 and Mountain Road. Right. Well, it, as uh, Ellen mentioned there, it, it was a, a blueberry field that had been owned by the Allen family for a long time. And I think that everybody just assumed that that was always going to stay a, a blueberry field and you know continue to be a, a very lovely spot but it went up for sale uh, in the early 80s uh, and it was purchased by um, a, a guy who lived here then, Walter Heiler, and he bought a couple of other pieces adjacent to it that, that had some of the woodland on it. So they actually owned pretty, pretty much all of the, the western front and side of the mountain excepting the house lot that's there on the corner. Uh, and it, he, he did that in the early 80s and, um, and just sat on it for a few years. And then in the mid 80s, mid late 80s, he uh, decided to subdivide it. And he put a subdivision application in front of the Blue Hill Planning Board. And there was um, a, a huge outcry about this because of people being surprised that it could suddenly have houses all over what had always been this beautiful view. Uh, and uh, it ended up being denied by the planning board. And my sort of, I, I'm going to say my vague memory is they actually denied it on aesthetic grounds, which is unusual. Um, and he then uh, went to, to a plan B, which was to divide it up and give pieces of it to himself, his wife, and his two minor children. So, and maybe a corporation he formed too. So that basically had the same thing that he had uh, planned to subdivide it, but it was within the family and then um, wanted to start marketing it and, and further subdivide a couple of, he, he then put two applications in front of the planning board to further subdivide uh, some of the, of the pieces he had put in his, his name and his wife's name. Um, and the planning board, um, again, um, 
denied this. And anyway, it ended up going to Superior Court, um, which sided with him, and then to the law court, which sided with the town of Blue Hill. And so at that point, uh, by that point, we we're up to 1990. And that was when it had, uh, the, you know, the, it was sort of at an impasse. Uh, I think one of the lots had been sold or one or two of the lots had been sold. So those are where the houses are there on the side of the mountain now, okay. um, 15. But uh, there was the rest was sitting there. And this was, you know, a topic of great discussion in the trust as to, you know, what could be done, could be, possibly do this. It was so much money that he wanted for this. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, this is this is the first time you're thinking about raising money to buy land and, and the first time you're thinking about buying land and you barely own any land at that point. That's really pretty much all the trust had at that point were conservation easements. So this was this was a really big decision. And then and then Walter proposed to the trust that the trust buy it for Ellen and I were debating we think it was 300,000 was yeah, the number. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and that, uh, so there was, you know, how on earth are we gonna raise $300,000? This was 30 years ago. That was a, a huge amount of money. I mean, it's hard to kind of imagine now how, how very big that seemed, um, but that's, that's what happened um, and how, yeah. how it came about. And there was a hard deadline for raising the money uh, of the end of um, 1993. Yeah, that's right. And so this is where Ellen Werner picks up here in her recollection. And she says, um, in the early 90s, Jean was ready to step down and no one was ready to assume the presidency. And at one meeting, the slate was presented and there was no vice president. So Jean pleaded and begged and I agreed to hold the place and told the board that I could not be the next president because I had a business, three teenage children, and was planning to run for the legislature. And at the next annual meeting in August, the slate was passed. And at the end of 1991, very unfortunately, Jean was driving home, had a major car accident and passed away. And so Ellen, by default, became the president of Blue Hill Heritage Trust at that time. And she said, at this point, it was clear that the land was gonna be developed on that side of the mountain. The subject kept coming up, as you said, at meetings, people were very worried about it. And then finally, Walter came to the trust saying, you should buy it for $300,000 by December 31st, 1993. And so Ellen says, we agreed. And I was president. I hadn't wanted to be president. I didn't have the time. And now the trust was facing its biggest challenge. And so away we went. And she said, we all dug in really deep. We asked our friends and Frank Hamabi designed a t-shirt that we could sell. And Ellen still has hers and she's going to show it to me this summer. I can't wait to see it. And Brad Emerson gave us permission, and here it is, to do a limited run of the Fitzhenry Lane print of the mountain to sell all as fundraisers. And they wrote proposals and got grants and people gave. And the money slowly added up and we almost had it. And on December, at the last week of December, they were very, very close. And on December 31st, she went to the post office, opened the mail, and there was the final check to get across the finish line. And we met our goal. I mean, that's like, holy moly, <laughs> down to the wire. Absolutely down to the wire. And to think about the way the mountain looks now and all of that, it's just incredible, but it also is really game changing for the way the trust does this. And so Jim, I'm gonna throw this one to you. You know, when the trust purchased this first parcel of land, 19 acres, how did that change the way that we conserved land and the way we looked at it? Well, oh, first I'll say that I wonder if that check was mine because because <laughs> Ellen Ellen Best, who was my friend from law school, was leaning on me, and I had just moved in '93 up here full time after owning land up here, and uh, I remember she saying, "I can't find your check. Where is it?" So, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> could have been, <laughs> could have been, 
Anyway, well, I mean, it's a good question because at that point in time, uh, in the early 90s, land trusts were not owning land. I mean, even Maine Coast Heritage Trust, which was the progenitor of all these local land trusts that was promoting them, was not owning land itself. It was relying on uh, uh, conservation easements. And so there was still that that uh, question in the land trust community then of, you know, sh should land trusts, these little local land trusts own land? Should bigger land trusts own land or should we rely on this conservation easement tool? Uh, but it, it, it it did break the ground. I mean, the land trust had already accepted a couple of gifts of land, so it wasn't as though they were landless, but this was the first time really of uh, the question of should we and could we raise money to buy land as opposed just to accept gifts? And that was another question that uh, the land trust continued to struggle with about you know raising money, owning land uh, versus just gifts of land or gifts of conservation easements. And uh, slowly uh, that uh, question progressed and, uh, uh, and uh, we went from there. Uh, you know, shortly thereafter, and it wasn't that long really, it was in uh, 1998 that Louise Frederick died and uh, she bequested her land, which included this uh, tower uh, land, uh, 70 acres on the mountain, as well as her house, I might add, uh, to the land trust. And uh, it allowed us to begin building a trail and doing the things that now make the mountain really accessible. And, and I guess I would also say that, you know, before that, the question was to protect land, but not necessarily to provide uh, uh, opportunities for people to get on it. The first job was to, let's, let's protect some land. And for, initially it was just view sheds. It was just like beautiful places that you can see from the water or from uh, later from the automobiles on the road, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't about public access, which mm. presented a whole range of different questions for the land trust as it developed and uh, both locally and in statewide and nationally too. Yeah. Yeah, and that's continued to be an ever-growing focus of the land trust movement is this shift towards community conservation and having the needs of the community and accessibility be a major, a major, you know, point when you're thinking about the conservation value of a place above and beyond the sort of environmental value. So but but I have to say that, you know, part of the initial you couldn't have that until you had some land. Right. And, and, and putting a, 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 a banking land, if you will, and, th and that's what we did in Blue Hill here, is to bank these varieties, pieces of land all over the landscape that has allowed this to develop this, this more, this access that people so value now. And it's so fortunate we have it, uh, given the, the episode we're in right now in our, our history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well and I had a, uh, in, in getting ready for this, I did a little research on dates on when, you know, pieces on the mountain came into ownership and so on, just so I'd have it fresh in my mind. And the thing that really amazed me was, uh, was the, the, um, the Ruth Hayes Field, the field that the town yeah. owns, um, which is sort of the basis, I think, for really, you know, the, the starting the owning land on, and really keeping the, the mountain um, as a, a public place, that didn't come into the the town didn't acquire that um, or was gifted it actually until 1977, right. um, which was you know a lot later than I had thought. Um, I was living here in 1977 and I had no idea that the town hadn't owned that for years. It, it was well, treated as though it were, it were but and th you know. that was an interesting fact that many people didn't know that the town owned, that it was public property. There was no trail and you, it was, you know, the town was using it to harvest berries on and and certain people knew it and used it, but it, it wasn't a publicly known until, really until 2004 or so when we had this uh, grand uh, uh, conflict, if you will, because there was a tower on the mountain and uh, the trust had built a new trail up on the Louise Frederick track, the old trail to the tower. 
and ATVs were starting to run up the new trail from the backside of the mountain to service the tower. And it was like, oh dear, so we have a use conflict here. How do we deal with that? And so we did this arrangement with the town where we said, and with the tower, tower owner, Dan McGraw, who was, who was really great about this, they said, okay, we'll, we'll create a separate access point for the vehicles that need to service the mountain. Call it the service trail. And Dan was responsible for building that. And the land trust, I might add, assumed responsibility for monitoring and taking care of making sure it was, it was uh, well-maintained. And, uh, and which freed the, that uh, ended that conflict because they had an hour way to go up. And all of a sudden that, that, that town owned property became uh, present in people's lives. And also, I mean, people started, once that trail was built, people said, well, it's our service trail, but it's easier walking. So I'm gonna use it. So it, <laughs> it didn't completely end all the conflicts, but essentially right. did. <laughs> That's right. And Mary, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a stewardship question at you in just a minute. But Jim, while while you're on a roll here, I'd like you to touch a little bit on how the conservation on the mountain really did evolve. I mean, as people are watching these slides, and the slide here sort of starts the conservation mm -hmm. on the mountain. And I I had it in my notes as 75, and Ellen, you're probably right. It was, it was 77. Um, but Jim, can you talk about that a little bit? Because it's not like one big thing happened. It's really a patchwork quilt yeah. and, uh, yeah, and a sure, lot of different sure. ways yeah. to conserve land. A, a different, yeah, different ways over time. And, you know, in some ways it's the story of how uh, land conservation gets done in a larger scale because it, you know, it starts with sort of a vision and people had the vision of this place being important and it should be protected. And then, and then there's sort of relationships that develop. Okay, who, who are the owners? Louise Frederick, we know Louise Frederick, she loves the mountain. She got to know the land trust, began to trust the land trust uh, as well as others. And then there's sort of this, what I call focus patience. You're sort of paying attention, but you're waiting for the opportunity to arise when something can happen that will implement your vision. And then lastly, you've got to have the skill to do the deals because all, <laughs> There was a lot of interesting deals going on in this mountain, actually. There were like, tw to date, there's been 12 separate transactions, everything from a, uh, a quarter acre to, to 108 acres. And of course, the town property is 175 acres. It's the biggest one of them all, a singular piece. Uh, so, and it's gone on from, if you start with 1977, with the, where, where uh, uh, the Hayes property was gifted to the town with for conservation purposes, which was key. Uh, from there through 2014, we continued to add properties. And I might add, there's still some more to go. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope someone's paying attention up there. <laughs> but, uh, and they've come in by gifts and purchases. And uh, there's a couple of conservation easements involved, particularly on the trail up to the mountain. Yep. Uh, that people use from the post office. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful history of, but it's, 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 it, and, you know, I have to say the, 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 the one that really capped it for me was the one we thought we would never, never see happen, which was the, the, the second slope, second peak uh, that was, that was in a family ownership and it was a divided family and they didn't, they both, there was separate, separate common ownership, complicated arrangement. And uh, it happened in 2014, one family said, uh, Kitty Clements family actually said, you know, here it is, here's, a, here's, our under, here's an undivided interest, good luck. And through, through, again, through relationships with the other people, we worked out a boundary and a deal. And so we were able to, to uh, have that as a gift, that that's that second slope up there. Well, someday there'll be a trail up there because there's an opportunity for that. But And so you'll be able to walk from 
the Hyla property, which we euphemistically now call the Wadwell Pasture, and up over that slope to the summit, and then back down through the Beckton Trail, if you will, to the Turkey Farm Road. It's it's, and then come down to town through the Post Office Trail and through the Bob Myers property, which is a story unto itself about uh, why they did what they did, and uh, its importance to the town. So yeah, maybe maybe that's enough. Well, I'm going to say Jim, Jim stole my, my thunder on that one for a minute, but I just want to say that the, the day I got to call Jim up and say, hey, how would you like to have the piece on the side of the mountain there? <laughs> and for for the Clement, the Clements family, let me make that call on their behalf. And was, that, that, that was, was that was a glorious movie. day because <laughs> everyone had said everyone had said it will never happen. It mm. they don't get along. They and it's a divided common interest. It's a complicated ownership arrangement. It'll never happen. And there it was. You know that property is just the key, another key piece and a big piece. It's like sixty acres, I think, or and it, it, it falls down over the backside of the mountain. Even. Yeah, there's a few photos of um, some of those properties that are in the slideshow. And there's also a map that shows all of the conservation parcels that are labeled uh, with help from George <laughs> Fields, our associate director, um, and showing whether or not we purchased them or, or they were donated. So that'll yeah. be an interesting map for people to see. Okay. On there. And, and I'd also add, while I think of it, and uh, you know, that Louise Frederick, after, I mean, she gave an easement to the land trust on her right. property on the mountain. And then when she died, she, she bequested that property and she bequested her home, which the land trust uh, subsequently sold. And uh, it, it's what in, helped endow the, the stewardship of funding for the mountain. And uh, uh, the land trust kept an e uh, restrictive easement when they sold it uh, uh, on the property so it couldn't be totally developed. But uh, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful gift and really, a, a, you know, cause it, it included the summit of the mountain. And so it was like the, the really start of something really big, I think. That's right, the summit right here in this very photo. Right. We're looking at. And so Mary Ely, this is, this place is a place that you know really well. And you are the trail steward for the trails on the front side of the mountain. And that's a really heavy lift. Anybody <laughs> who knows the trails on the mountain knows that that's a lot of territory um, to be helping with. Can you talk a little bit about why you were drawn to be a trail steward of the mountain. And if you want to stand up and show people your view, you can do that as well. <laughs> I will, I'll show my view first. I don't know if you can see this, it's getting darker, but that's what I'm looking at every day. Um, it, so it goes back, back to 1988, when we first um, started clearing our property that we got, um, thank, with, with help from Ellen Best and Lori White. And as we were clearing our house site, lo and behold, we discovered that through the trees, we could see the mountain. So over the years, we've, we've cleared more and more, and now we have this really amazing commanding view of the mountain. And because of that, and I'm a hiker, it calls to me every single day. And um, so I started hiking it and getting to know it like the back of my hand and literally just fell in love with the mountain. Um, and um, I remember when we first moved here, the fire tower was still there. And I remember going up the fire tower and seeing the ranger and him showing us the map that he had up there and showed us the view of Katahdin mm. from the summit, which was pretty cool. Um, Do you remember his name, Mary? I don't know, but I remember the map because it was this round map and um, my kids were little and they were blown away by this. And then, um, <laughs> I also remember going to the mountain when the kids were older after the fire tower had been taken down with sledgehammers and pounding away at those pieces of cement that were left on the <laughs> summit. There still are some, some pieces yes. there, but 
but it was me and my boys that pounded away at that cement <laughs> to try to free the mountain of the old foundations from the fire tower. Yeah, Rob McCall used to used to hack at those too. I remember. Yeah, well, I, we went with Rob McCall to do it. Um, but I think it was about maybe six years ago, I learned that the trust was looking for a trail steward at the mountain. And at that time, um, I was involved with the Maine Master Naturalist Program and was expected to start doing some volunteer work with in my local community. And when I found out they needed a trail steward, I jumped at the chance. <laughs> because I just felt like, wow, this would be a way to give back to this place that I love so much. And um, also it gave me the chance to make the trails more pleasant for other people to go and enjoy the mountain. So that, that was kind of the main reason. And mm -hmm. along with that, I love having the connection with all the awesome staff at the trust. So it's given me that nice connection. And because I'm the trail steward and I'm required to go there very regularly, which is easy because I'm there a couple days a week, if not more, it gives me that chance or that excuse to just <laughs> go and observe nature in all the different seasons and um, the wildlife habitat and just how the it's constantly changing. You could never get bored on that mountain. And there's different ways and orders that you can hike it. So, um, and the different people that you meet on the mountain is always really interesting too. So I, I'm looking at my notes because I don't want to forget. Oh, I know. The other thing is, um, there's always a surprise on the mountain. You, you just go, you know, open hearted and, um, you know, I'm, I'm always inspecting the trails and throwing off branches and noticing um, rocks that need to go back into place. But there's often surprises and I've seen the snowshoe hare up there and um, I like to go after the big windstorms to see what trees have fallen down so I can call the trust and say, Somebody needs to do it you know, with their chainsaw because I don't use the chainsaw. I do use my little handsaw, but, um, and one day after a windstorm, I went up and um, there were not trees down, but there in the middle of the bottom of the Osgood Trail was a dead porcupine. Aww. And he was just laying there on his back. And we figured out that he must have been blown out of the top of a tree and broke his neck. So, so there's just always these little unexpected surprises of nature that you find on the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. One of the slides back was that sweet photo of the ermine that George Fields caught, was hiking up the mountain for something, you know, six years ago. And this little ermine was playing peekaboo with him and he has a video <laughs> of it. And it's just, you know, these incredible little things that you, that you see. And of course, you know, we we have to talk about Rob McCall for a second because he is the, you know, he is sort of the master of studying uh, the mountain. And if folks are really interested in sort of the natural cycles of the mountain, they should look um, for Rob's book. And just, you know, he really, he's hiked the mountain so many times and done beautiful presentation for us in the past. And we should get Rob to do one of these, uh, of yeah. his sort of study of the mountain. That would be, that would be great because he, it, it, for people like you, Mary and Rob, and there are so many others who hike the mountain every day, multiple times a week. Um, my friend Colin, who owns Fairwinds, hiked it all through her pregnancy multiple times, even when she was in labor. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it, it does, it calls to people for a variety of reasons. Um, Ellen, you've been involved with the trust for over 30 years, as I said. I wonder what you think, you know, how you think the conservation efforts like the mountain have really changed the community's understanding and connection to the work that the trust does. 
Well, I think that particularly the mountain, um, because it's the, the shining example of it is, but it, it's such a, an obvious uh, example of how the trust serves the whole community uh, and how it's made this, these resources available of the community that you know, might have been available to a few people who did it through permission or just did it and didn't get permission, you know, but to have access to the kinds of, of things that you were, that you and Mary were just talking about, you know, this extraordinary wildlife and views and the, you know, the, the, uh, just the, the ability to be out in nature and enjoy it, uh, that is not, that, that something like the municipal infrastructure is, uh, is not able to provide and the state doesn't provide in, you know, can't provide on such a, a minute scale. You know, they, they have things that they're able to do and they're great, but they're not going to be able to provide within every uh, municipality or, or area, the kind of things that the trust is able to do and, and to really tailor to local um, concerns and, and uh, spots that, people wouldn't know about otherwise. I mean, you know, we have so many wonderful spots that, uh, you know, you, you would never know about um, unless the trust said, oh, here's this wonderful trail that goes up by this brook. And, um, you know, people did know about walking up Blue Hill Mountain, I think for a long time, but not the kind of trails that have been, uh, have been put out. And, and prior to that, like Jim was saying, it really was, you know, holding conservation easements and, a lot of them that wasn't it wasn't allowing for access it was it's it's nice to it's it's better than nice to preserve views it's important to preserve views and we have some you know definitely world class views around here but the ability to get out and and actually physically be on the land is just huge and that's one of the big things that this has done yeah and mary what are some reflections that you can share with us about interactions you have with folks on the mountain. I mean, you're up there so much and in all seasons. Um, what are you hearing from people or just sort of quietly witnessing? Um, well, first of all, it's people of all ages that go there. I see families with, you know, little kids in backpacks and there's one um, guy that I see there regularly, he's 99 and he tries to hike the mountain. He just goes up the field, but up the mountain every day he tries. And so, you know, I think it just serves all ages. Um, it's, it really serves the needs of birders and naturalists who are going to make their observations, um, birders with their binoculars and naturalists with their magnifier loops. Um, um, the other thing that, I mean, I think of it as a sacred place for people. I see celebrations there, all different kinds of celebrations, celebrations of life. I've seen a wedding on the mountain. Um, I see people who go there to watch the sunset or the sunrise or the moon. People go there to see the, um, the meteor showers. Um, so, so I think that it, it has a pretty intense sacred um, purpose to it. Um, the, oh, there's been, I've, I've seen several celebrations of life there. Um, so the other thing that to me, I notice a lot is when people go away and come back to Blue Hill, whether they're summer people or there are college kids who have come back home um, for a vacation. The mountain is the place that gives you the sense of place. And, and I think there's a gravitational pull for people to, to go there and remember where they are because from there you see not only out to Blue Hill Bay, but all the way to the ocean and you see the um, MDI to the east and Camden Hills to the west, and it, it really gives you this deep sense of place, those views that we all just love. Um, and, and I think that that, you know, has a really deep meaning to everybody I see on the mountain. So 
And there are a lot of people who hike it every single day. Yes. Christy, I'd like to just, uh, since I see your pictures up there about the, the trails and, and just uh, mention a little bit about the development of the trails because yeah. uh, it, was a, it was a big deal. Uh, you know, the, the original trail up the mountain was a, uh, it's where the Osgood Trail is now. It was used by a, a vehicle trail to get, finally, to get people up there to the observation tower. And I think uh, Gordon Emerson always claimed that he was maybe the first one to drive up there in a, a vehicle. <laughs> I can't remember. I remember he drove up there. Uh, but when we got that land, the trust got that land from uh, as a bequest, uh, soon thereafter, we got the help of uh, the trail master from, from Baxter State Park uh, to come and help design trails and build those stone steps that people use there, which was a massive undertaking. I mean, it, it was uh, amazing because we were lifting rocks with wires and doing all these things. And there were like, not so many people regularly participated, but Peter Clapp was one of them every Saturday and a few others. And uh, it was amazing. And I remember, I remember sometime after they were built that first set, these people coming who were visiting here and came up to one of us and said, oh, um, well, I'm too lucky to have found those, those rocks laid in such a good place that a natural <laughs> set of steps. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. We're pretty smart, pretty smart right down here. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so that that was, you know, and then we had the Conservation Corps come back and help uh, do more projects there. And, uh, and then on the town land uh, that that if people remember, there was this huge gully uh, based on uh, caused by vehicular access during the blueberry harvesting days. And it was like six feet deep and erosion and you could see it from the water and the air. It was a big scar on the mountain. And it was one of Rob McCall's big thing. We have to heal that thing. And, and we raised a lot of money through the help of some really industrious people who were willing to do that. And again, Lester Kenway uh, from a Baxter led the design and the Conservation Corps crew that built those stairs that now replaced it and Frank, it was, I was amazed by how quickly it restored the landscape. The vegetation came back and pretty soon that was just hidden. Uh, it was sort of restored in a remarkable way. Um, hey Jim, can I ask yep. you a question? Did, um, yes. Are you talking about the stairs on the Osgood Trail or the Hayes? I, I, I was initially, and then I was talking about, excuse me, the one on the town's property, Those, those that set of stairs is the second one, which was the, where the big erosion scar was, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I remember um, working with Lester Kenway on when the uh, Osgood Trail was rerouted because the trail used to go sort of straight up and was yeah. totally right. eroded and, um, he was in. He was the leader of that um, rerouting of the Osgood Trail, and it was kind of amazing the number of people and the number of hours it would take yeah. to just build like three stairs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was an incredible undertaking. And then there are we also during that period built like twenty five water bars up and uh, mm -hmm. up along the trail, and which right. is a constant maintenance issue. And some work and some don't because the water flow has changed, but. Uh, it's a, it, it's a constant stewardship thing. I mean, the, the, it's amazing the wear the trail uh, uh, sustains during the course of a year. It's really, a, it, you know, people do have an impact, is, uh, yes. I must say. Well, and especially now, this, this year with the pandemic, um, the mountain's been used more than yeah. ever, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. A lot of people that w wouldn't normally have used it. Yeah. I, while we're talking stewardship, if I can just add on here, you know, it hasn't been without controversy uh, because when the that uh, tower, I mean, that is the lookout tower that everyone loved and they loved to climb 130 feet in the air and look up at Katahdin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in the early 2000s, we were, you know, no one was taking care of it. I mean, the state owned it. The state was would drive by and look up there and say, oh yeah, it's still there. And we who were sort of worried about it own the land underneath it, that is the land trust, 
we're thinking, well, all of a sudden there's one of those legs is not secured anymore. So in a heavy breeze, it's sort of lifting off. And so we <laughs> had this, this whole, whole decision about, you know, how, what do we do? Because it's huge liability. And the amazing thing to me was that people would let their children run up that thing as though it was just a, a recreation area. And I was, I was, I was literally frightened that uh, we'd, we'd have some serious injury. And so eventually the state agreed to take it down because it was their responsibility. And they, they actually, they brought in uh, uh, prisoners from the Down East Correctional Center to help uh, oh. take it down. And uh, they brought in a helicopter to help lift off some of the stuff and ATVs that went up the ATV trail and it, it, it went away as did the, as did the house that the ranger stayed in that got uh, right. disassembled and uh, people were people were vandalizing it so it was a nice little cabin but it was wasn't mm -hmm. uh, wasn't being taken care of so that was that was sort of an issue and the second issue was the was the communication tower when uh, the owner of it rebuilt it decided he had to rebuild it and uh, there was a lot of uh, controversy and uh, about whether that whether it should just come down and how could it be rebuilt and why should it be rebuilt and you know it was a, it was a it was a conflicting time because cell phones were still getting starting to get high use and there wasn't many and that tower was the that mountain was the obstacle for a lot of communication so that to for people to use cell phones here and you would see people's cell phones complaining about the tower on the mountain and you know the the <laughs> And you know, just not understanding the how it all works here. So anyway, that's uh, it, it too uh, went away. And I have to say, the owner of the tower, Dan McGraw, and his company did a fantastic job of building that service trail. He spent much money. I mean, uh, tens and tens of thousands of dollars to get that trail up there and maintain it. Uh, it's it was really a, a big project. And a lot of people hike that trail, and I know that was not its intended use, but for a lot of people, it's a it's a lower impact trail to come down, uh, and it's a lot easier on the knees and things like that, and it's an easier trail to hike with small kids to get them to fall in love with hiking the mountain, and so it really, yeah. it's it served the, the community both through the needs through the communications tower, also you know, for access on the mountain, which has been really great. Um, we have a couple of questions that I thought I'd throw out there. So Mary Barnes is wondering, was there any awareness back when the original sort of conservation efforts were happening on the mountain about the land being originally indigenous land and whether or not it had any sacred sites on it? Do you remember Jim or Ellen? I don't remember that ever coming up um, as an issue. No, no, I, I, I don't either. And I, I don't remember that Rob uh, McCall, who was, who was sort of the guardian of the, the spiritual side of that, if you will, mm -hmm. of the mountain, uh, speaking about the indigenous use. But I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, most what I do know is most of the indigenous use was near the water here on the mm -hmm. uh, host of sites along the bays here. But I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it is a it is a Monadnock. I mean, this mountain it's that mm -hmm. that's freestanding mountain in a general plain, and uh, so it's hard to believe it didn't have some significance, uh, you know, a spiritual significance to to native peoples because just of its it's the physical land form. But uh, often these those places, those spiritual places, uh, they didn't go to. They didn't go up them. They, they observed them and. Uh, appreciated them and used them as spiritual symbols, but they, you didn't, you didn't, it wasn't for humans to, to just go out for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah, that would be a great question to ask the Penobscot Cultural Center, yeah. who, who probably are, are more well equipped to answer, answer those yeah. sorts of questions than we are for sure. Uh, no, Sharon? No. Sorry, Mary? It, I think that would be really important to find out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Sharon Fitzgerald asks, uh, can you tell us what types of snakes 
were in the photo with the group of turkeys. I I think those are milk snakes, but yeah. I, yeah, they are. Yeah, and that's a great photo because they were big. They were definitely big and there were two of them and they were intertwined on the steps of the Hayes Trail, sunning themselves, <laughs> which would have been quite yeah. a startling sight. I look forward to seeing I look forward to seeing the milk snakes every spring. They, oh, they wow. live there in those steps. Yeah. And um, they're very docile, yes. kind snakes that should be treated kindly. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're walking on their home. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember people coming into our office and saying, oh my goodness, there's a snake. Is it a rattlesnake? Uh, <laughs> I know, should I be worried? I mean, between between that and and the reports of mountain lions on the mountain, right. which which uh, from reliable sources, uh, although no one's ever documented it, uh, we we don't know. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, I'm still waiting to see the mountain lion on the mountain. <laughs> Always looking, but I know people have seen bears on the mountain. So, um, Mary Robbins is asking about what book we're referring to, I think um, that's in, re in response to Rob McCall's book, which, it, which is an Anawaja Almanac. And you can find it at, I believe both bookstores here on the peninsula um, and Rob may sell them. They're through Presscart Books, I believe that it's called. Um, Push Randy- Pushcart. Pushcart, thank you. Uh, Randy Curtis was asking about sort of the evolution of schools using the mountain. And as There's people, oh, good, thanks. Um, and yeah. as, as some of the photos have shown, uh, a number of local schools like to do really big group hikes up the mountain. And um, they're, you know, I think that that's happened for a long time. Mary, do you know how long the Bay School, because the Bay School has a solid annual tradition Yep, hiking. we've been doing it. Um, well, I mean, the Bay School has been around for 35 years plus. Um, I don't know how many years they've been doing it, but they've been doing it as long as I've been there and that's over 20 years. Hmm. Um, they always do it the last Friday of September. So yeah, it's a big tradition. Yeah, and one of the photos was of um, George Stevens Academy a few years in a row, and it, it I'm sure would have continued this year, but COVID got in our way. Um, George Stevens liked to do a senior hike up the mountain to allow the entire senior class an opportunity to hike from the school all the way up to the mountain and back and really observe their school's town and community from a distance and have a facilitated conversation with Blue Hill Heritage Trust about community and you know what it means to be a part of a community when you're at this point in your life where you may be leaving it and returning. And Mary and I have had the opportunity to hike with them and talk with them about that um, from our perspectives and other staff members of Blue Hill Heritage Trust have gone as well. And that's a really nice um, tradition that we have started that I hope that we can get back to with them. And then of course the other photo was Blue Hill Consolidated School did a really big group hike and they've had different classes also go up the mountain as well. So it's, I think it's sort of a rite of passage for a lot of these kids in these schools. And it's a wonderful thing for the schools to do because there are, you know, some kids who grow up here who have never hiked the mountain and some adults who've never hiked the mountain. And so to let these kids have this sort of fun field trip with their school and go up the mountain is such a great experience. Um, so I really appreciate that they, that they get to do that. <clears throat> John Merrifield says that he saw a mountain lion one evening near the parking lot um, on the town side and he, uh, he could not get a, a photo. Um, and John Merrifield is a former board member and definitely somebody I would trust. So that would be, that would be very exciting. Uh, bobcat sightings. Any, has anybody seen a bobcat up on the mountain? 
I never have, but I'm, I mean, I would imagine that they go near it, especially on that backside closer to Toddy Pond. I bet, I bet there are bobcats along there. I've, I, well. I've run into a moose on the backside of the mountain. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's interesting. Oh, that, and the, there actually, we go. The, back, the backside off the uh, Becton Trail, because it runs a, at the head of Noise Pond, uh, and that wetland there is a natural moose country. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it, what I love about that side of the mountain is that it, it's totally different. I mean, it's, it, you're in a whole different place than the front side, the south side of the mountain, which you've got these grand views and the fields and the woods. But actually, the, the, the forest is different back there. The whole sense of place is very different. And uh, so if you do the whole hike up, like from the post office up and then down, it's, it's, it's a real array of, of yeah. different places within one hike in a yeah. in our, our little town. Pretty That's amazing. That's right. Yeah, I love doing that. I love doing the up and over hike. If you go with a group and have people park on either side and sort of coordinate it, it's a great hike. And somebody had just asked a question about moose. So that was, that was very good timing there. Um, anything else, Jim or Alan or Mary, that you can think of that we didn't cover that's really important to this story of the mountain and Blue Hill Heritage Trust? Well, uh, you've done a good job, I think. You know, uh, there's one key piece I can think of you need to get, though. It's somebody we worked on it for years, didn't quite happen, but maybe it will. Um, uh, particularly coming up from the post office there, that, that's the section there. But, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty incredible uh, to have assembled this and to make it an asset for this town. And certainly now as, you know, as a select board member in the fair town of Blue Hill, I really appreciate that we have this for people. Well, and, and I would add, um, just because I am a trail steward along with two other people um, that are also trail stewards. Nina Milliken is the trail steward of the Becton Trail and um, Marsha McKeague is the trail steward of the post office trail. Oh, that's that right. Yeah. That um, everybody can really be stewards of the mountain. We can all do our little part of taking care of it. And, um, <laughs> One of the big things is to remember to leave no trace. Yep, absolutely. Take out what you brought in and leave leave it as you found it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah. And as we're we're learning um, here at the trust, it uh, sometimes thinking of it as leaving a beautiful trace. Um, that every time we tread somewhere, we're leaving our mark, but to be really wary of how we're caring for that place um, and leaving it better than we found it, which is I think the goal of conservation in general. Jim, we've got this map up here. You wanna highlight the, the key piece that you think <laughs> to be conserved? No, no, I'm gonna leave that for, you know, that's like, you know, in, in, in land negotiations, you, you just, you know, you try to do that in private and then, then once yeah. it's done, you, you broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> George knows what it is, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, and this is really I interesting. Mean, you know, really. Go ahead, Go ahead Alan. Chrissy. No, you go. <laughs> no, I was just saying, I wanted to just follow up on what, what Jim said about, you know, what we've done, and, and when you think about it, it, really was in the span of just a little over 20 years of putting together all these pieces, and uh, which is in, you know, land trust years, not so long, and that, that was a lot to put together, but it's, you know, taking those first, those first leaps into the unknown are really hard, but it worked out great. Yeah, and, and, I, and I would add, actually, that, you know, we had to purchase a lot of this land and, uh, you know, including the first piece that, that the initial piece, but other pieces as well. And, and so a lot of people participated in that. And, uh, and actually our various capital campaigns, the, the, the 1990, the, the 2000, what do we call it? Peninsula 2000 campaign around the year 2000 uh, generated a lot of money that allowed us to uh, purchase some of these places and, uh, and, and some, and some gifts. And so it's been a, it's been a combination, but it has taken money and, 
and land conservation takes money. Uh, so uh, thank you to all those people who have contributed. And speaking of money, Tate Yoder wants to know, have there ever, and Jim, this is probably a good question for you or Ellen as the trust lawyer, have there ever been any just crazy ideas that we've shot down from people who maybe wanted to see if we could put up a ski lift or a big mountain bike <laughs> jump going down the mountain? Any, anything like that ever come across your desks? Uh, I would say not yet. <laughs> All right, Tate, now's your moment. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Durnbaugh put the, uh, when, when Jerry used to run the, the weekly packet, he always had a great April Fool's um, headline. And a ski lift on the mountain was one of it one year. <laughs> I, I, I would add that we, at one point in time, not so many years ago, uh, we had a bunch of hang gliders sailing off the mountain. And, uh, and that was out of a regular event that these three or four people would uh, take off from where, just below the, the communications tower and end in the field down below. Yep. And I think it ended when one of them got caught in a wire, uh, one it of the wires. Has, it has started again. People oh. <laughs> with, you know, when, when in pandemic, what else are you gonna do? but jump off the mountain <laughs> with a kite. So yeah, there are yeah. people, we can see them from my mom's house. There's a great view of the mountain of people paragliding down off the mountain. It's wild. So yeah, oh, well. I know all sorts of uses. Well, I'm just gonna look right here to see if we have any more questions. We're at an hour and I think that we, we have answered folks questions. So thank you everyone for joining us. We had a really good audience of nearly 70 people here and people are just flooding in thanking you all for sharing your stories and your memories. Um, I want to say thank you to Peter Clapp uh, without whom you know, the trust may not be. I mean, he was such an important figure and he's going to be helping me with these stories moving forward. Uh, and Ellen Werner, who couldn't be here with us today, but we're really grateful for her spending some time to share her memories. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to want to let folks know that we have our next one of these on February 4th. And we'll be talking to the Friends of Morgan Bay, who are a really fun group of neighbors who worked on a really interesting group effort to conserve some important pieces of land down there in Morgan Bay. That's a wild story. It's really inspirational. And so we'll be doing that on February 4th. So you can, uh, you can find information about that on our website and on our Facebook page. And um, thank you, Jim, Ellen, Mary. Thank you to everybody who contributes to this work. If you feel so inclined to, uh, to support this work, you can find a, a donate button on our website. And, Good for you. And we, uh, you know, we, we don't do this work. We can't do yeah. this work without everybody's help. So thank you very much. Uh, Jim Dow, what's your favorite trail to hike on Blue Hill Mountain? Oh, I like the old Osgood Trail. Uh, frankly, it, it, it has a lot of meaning to me. Ellen Best? Well, as you know, I haven't been able to walk or hike anything for years now, but Tuesday I'm having my final operation. So I'm looking forward to going up the Hayesfield. Excellent. <laughs> Yay. And Mary Ely, what's your favorite? Um, I would say the Hayes Trail. Um, because I like the open, the views that you get from it. And um, in addition, Larry's Loop. Yeah, Larry's <laughs> Loop is great. Thank you, yeah. Larry. All right, well, we're going to close it out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you again to our panelists. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.